Sociological data showing that Christian men actually do better. They have better marriages. They have happier families. How can we bring that data into the churches? No more scolding. You know, build men up, and and that way, men are hearing a much different message at church. Welcome to the Mama Bear Apologetics Podcast. A podcast where we teach you to roar like a mother. And by roar, we mean recognize the message, offer discernment, argue for a healthier approach, and reinforce these ideas with your kids. Unless you want to growl around your house. I mean, that's cool too. (laughs) You're like, check it, we keep it reals. (laughs) That's so bad. You're awesome. Mama Bear Apologetics is a listener-supported program, so if you like what we do, head on over to the Mama Bear Apologetics website and click support. It's time to rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. This might not affect your faith, but it might affect your children. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Mama Bear Apologetics podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you raise children who love biblically, think critically, and stand firm in the faith. With me today, I'm so excited, is Professor Nancy Piercy, author of such works like Total Truth and now, most recently, The Toxic War on Masculinity. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Amy. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Now, we are releasing this podcast around Father's Day because we want it to be an encouragement. Because one thing we have noticed within culture as of recently is there is a huge assault on not just our fathers, but even our sons as well. And so this podcast is dedicated to helping mothers, grandmothers, everyone out there within the church to help you be aware of what's going on in culture against manhood, masculinity, how in the world we got here, and how we as a church can help build up the fathers within our community. And Nancy, I'm just so grateful that you are able to to help us figure that out and navigate that. Yeah, um, I have to tell you, the reason I wrote this book is because I was taken aback by how socially accept- acceptable it's become to attack men. Uh, there was a one of the early um, articles that caught my eye was in the Washington Post, and it was titled, mm. Why Can't We Hate Men? Right. I thought, really? In a respected publication or uh, the Huffington Post, an editor tweeted, hashtag, kill all men, and said it was a joke. And speaking of jokes, you can buy T-shirts that say, so many men, so little ammunition. Gosh, and it blows my mind because if if that was reversed, I mean the the feminist outcry against that would just be enormous. So I, I'm with you. Like, how did this become socially acceptable to just vilify and attack men so much? Yeah, and and by the way, what really um, tears my heart apart is that there are men who are jumping on the bandwagon too. There was a, a male author, book author, who said talking about. Healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. Golly. And then um, you may have seen this because it was in the news just a few months ago. The director of the movie Avatar, James Cameron, said testosterone is a toxin and you have to work it out of your system. So this is what I was addressing in my book. You know, I'm an apologist at heart. I like to try to show why the secular view is wrong. And in this case, what I wanted to do is say, huh? Why does the secular world get masculinity so wrong? You know, where did right. that come from? And, you know, and what's a Christian response? So that's the theme of the book. Oh, and it, and it is so needed in culture today. And, you know, before we before we dive in on all of that, Nancy, can you just share maybe some of the good news? Because, you know, evangelical Christianity is so vilified in culture. It's always the root of the problem, the cause of abuse. But there's actually evidence that shows that within evangelical Christianity, they actually have the lowest levels of abuse and divorce. Can you kind of share a little bit of your research on that? Yeah, yeah. I was as surprised as anyone to find this. Um, And it's not out in the churches yet. I had to go digging in the academic journals to find these these, studies that were done. So let me start out by saying it's very easy to find quotes saying that Christian men, you know, test uh, certainly uh, if they hold any notion of headship in the home, that will turn them into overbearing tyrannical patriarchs. 
Right. I'll give you just one. This was the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which followed the Me Too movement. Right. And she said, the theology of male headship feeds the mm. rape culture that we see permeating American Christianity today. Mm. So the social scientists were listening to this and saying, where's your evidence? You're making these charges, but where's your data? Yes. And so they went out and they did the studies. And in my book, I quote about a dozen different studies that all found, as you said, that in fact, Christian men, evangelical men who attend church regularly, who are committed, who are authentic in their Christian convictions, actually test out as the most loving and engaged husbands and fathers. And they do test their wives as well. So their wives test out as being the happiest. Mm -hmm. um, they spend more time with their children, 3.5 hours more per week than secular fathers. Evangelical couples divorce at a lower rate than the secular world, 35% lower. And they actually have the lowest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any major group in America. Wow. So this was a, a big surprise on all sides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let me give you a quote, because sometimes a quote can really crystallize it. Um, the sociologist who did the largest study is Brad Wilcox at the University mm -hmm. of Virginia. And he, to give you a sense of his stature, he gets published in places like the New York Times. So wow. this was a, uh, yeah, right. Not too many Christians managed to do that. No, not at all. <laughs> so this was an article from the it, that was published in the New York Times, and he said, direct quote, it turns out that the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. Fully 73% of women who hold conservative gender values and attend church regularly with their husbands have yeah. high-quality marriages. Wow. So this is not a pep talk from some yeah. you know religious leader. This is solid empirical research. You know th these are data based findings, and we should be very confident about both bringing them into the church to encourage Christian men, as well as bringing them in, into the public square to to debunk the secular narrative. Yeah. Well, and that's what's so frustrating is sometimes it's that secular narrative that reigns supreme. I mean, that's the thing that gets retweeted, which goes viral because it's heavily emotionally saturated and it's easy to get caught up in, yeah, you know, there is this abuse and you hop on Netflix and there's always, you know, documentaries of conservative, uh, supposed Christian um circles that there's perpetuated abuse so it must be true and yet when you actually study the facts and the numbers it's the opposite that reigns supreme is no actually overwhelmingly evangelical families husbands and wives have that higher rate of satisfaction so yes you're right it does need to be more well known but but to push you know just for balance the pushback right. i always get is but haven't we all heard that christians divorce at the same rate as everyone else I know I've heard that. Yeah, I know. I know on, on these podcasts, I sometimes I, I'm talking to pastors and they go, oh, yeah, I use that. <laughs> um, but anyway, the um, social, social scientists went back to the data and they made that very important distinction between evangelical men who are very authentic and committed mm -hmm. versus nominal Christian men. So these are men who on a survey like this might check, say, the Baptist box. Right but who actually attend church rarely, if at all. Mm. And they actually do test out shockingly differently. They actually test out as having all of the toxic stereotypes. Their wives report the lowest level of happiness. They spend less time wow. with their children. They have a higher rate of divorce, even higher than secular men, 20% higher. Mm. And they have the highest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any group in America. Wow. I'll quote I'll quote my expert, my uh, Brad Wilcox, my sociologist again. This time he was writing in Christianity Today. And he said, the most violent husbands in America are evangelical Protestant men who are nominal and who mm. do not attend church. So this is what we're up against, actually, in the churches. You know, on the one hand, how can we bring the good data into the into the churches? to encourage men that, hey, if you live out God's word, you are going to have a happier marriage and family. On the other hand, how can we reach out to these men who are nominal? Mm -hmm. By the way, my, my students don't know what nominal means, so I have to tell them. N-O-M is Latin for name. So it means in name only. And so these are the men who are actually worse than secular men. And how, how do we reach out to these men who are kind of at the fringe of the, of the Christian world and help them to realize that 
they may be using words like headship and submission, but they're infusing meanings from the secular script for masculinity, not mm-hmm. from the biblical script. And so they need to be educated in what the Bible really says about masculinity. And so that, that's a tough call. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, that's that's going to require quite a bit of discipleship. And I, I love that distinction that you that you put in there because it's, wait a second, the true followers of Christ are quite different than the superficial box checking Christians. In fact, those in, individuals are more likely to basically exploit the tenets of headship within scripture to meet their end goals, to sort of use it to their advantage, to maybe it, have that oppressive relationship with their spouse and potentially children. Is that what's kind of being seen here? Yeah, ex- exactly. And, and of course, they're the ones who are shaping the negative stereotypes that are out in the, in the public realm. Is it's, you know, you and I probably hang around mostly with very committed Christian men. So I thought nominals would be a small group. Actually, in America, it's about the same size. Oh, wow. About the same number of, of committed Christian men and nominal Christian men. So that's why they they do end up in many ways shaping the public perception of Christians, which is another reason we should be motivated to reach out and disciple them, because they're destroying the reputation for all Christians. Golly. And, and, and of course, then it, it, the question then is where what is the secular script that they're absorbing? And so I do spend quite a bit of time in the book explaining, you know, how how the script for masculinity turned secular and, you know, how it got disconnected from a, a biblical view of what it means to be a man. Yeah. So let's touch on that a little bit, because one thing that that really sort of blew my mind is I know initially going into studying on uh, and reading your book, I was like, okay, well, this is something that's fairly recent. I'm thinking, you know, second, third wave feminism. I remember as a kid in the 90s, you know, those hardcore girl power, you know, we had it on our shirts and everything. But you throughout your research have found that this sort of aversion toward masculinity and everything, it's even further back. So it says there's Darwinian theory of evolution kind of normalized a lot of these these toxic traits that were being attributed toward, toward masculinity. So can you kind of uh, explain that a little bit? Yes, yes. But you know what? I'm going to go back even before Darwin. I want to talk about Darwin, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I was, I was just as surprised. Um, it turns out that you find it already in the 19th century uh, with the Industrial Revolution, because before that, men worked alongside their wives and families all day, right? Because it was a family farm or the family industry or the family business. And I, when I grew up in Europe, I grew up part part time in in for part of my childhood in in Europe, and they say it was still like that. You know, you get you go to the baker, and it's the front part of a home, and the whole family works together. And then you go to the butcher, and it's the same thing. And all my classmates are working, you know, in, in the shop with their family, and mm-hmm. so that's what it was like. And th- so the question is, how did we lose that? Well, the industrial revolution took work out of the home, and men had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And instead of working with people they loved and had a moral bond with, for the first time, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And that was a very different environment. Mm -hmm. And that's when you see the literature start to change. People started to complain that men were losing the caretaking ethos Mm -hmm. that was expected of them back when they worked with their whole family. And they were becoming egocentric, self-seeking, greedy Mm. and acquisitive, using language of the day, um, and turning their career success into an idol. Mm. Because this was also when America began to secularize. And so it is true that many men, you know, instead of working as part of the cultural mandate, you know, serving God in your work, you know, men were more likely to, in fact, work for financial success and professional achievement and so on. And so... That was the first time you see negative language applied to the male character. Mm. And so much earlier than most of us. Uh, when I read some of the literature, it was as, just as angry and hostile as what we see today. That's what surprised me. And, and then you asked about Darwin. So I, I really don't want to skip that point because I go through various stages in the book of how the script for masculinity became more secular over time. But one of the most important stages was the rise of Darwinian evolution. Mm. And most people are a bit surprised by that because they think, wait, wasn't that about science? (laughs) But the social Darwinists immediately began to apply it to masculinity. And they said, the men who came out on top in the struggle for survival would be the men who were 
ruthless, tough, barbarian, savage, and predatory. Mm. <laughs> so uh, this was Herbert Spencer who, who popularized uh, Darwinism here in America. Oh, by the way, Darwin himself also said that women are intellectually inferior to men. Right. So, so he bears some uh, responsibility for that as well. But social Darwinism is still around today. It's got a new label. It's called evolutionary psychology. Mm. But, for example, um, not long ago, there was a best-selling book called The Moral Animal. And the author said, the human male is an oppressive, possessive, flesh-obsessed pig. Giving him a booklet on how to have a better marriage is like giving Vikings a booklet on how not to pillage. Oh, geez. And, um and I thought, how can you get away with that? Mm. But but there's another one, too. Um, it was an older book that was just reissued called Men in Marriage. Mm-hmm. And the author also says, by nature, the human male is irresponsible, addiction-prone, violent, and predatory. His gr- deepest yearning is not, not for wife and family, yeah. but for the male group escape. I'm giving you direct quotes, right? The male is group escape, the open, the motorbike and the open road, um, the, the escape to a primal, primal and primitive m- mode of immediate gratification. And I thought, really, you, this, you, you're really going to claim this is how God made men? Yeah, you know, this is completely a secular script, and these are intellectuals. Yeah, so this is the source of the Andrew Tate phenomenon. Yes. You oh know? my gosh, <laughs> he's just a popularization of what these intellectuals are saying. You know, they sort of fast cars, fast money, fast women. Um, so if you want to know where Andrew Tate's coming from, you have to read. The, the thinkers who are, who are act, actually out there saying, well, since since we know Darwinism is true, you know, yeah. quote unquote, therefore, we the, this is what the masculine character really is. And wow. and by the way, the, the most common is that they are sexually promiscuous. Right. Um, you know, that's the, just natural. Um, there, there's an, a, a new online influencer who is heralded in The New York Post as the new Andrew Tate. Mm. His name is Myron Gaines. Okay, and some people know him better by his uh, program. It's called Fresh and Fit. Okay, but his tagline is "I help men transform from simps into pimps." Oh, geez, wow! And he literally says he he and Andrew Tate both say, "Well, it's okay for a guy to have one main girlfriend, but she needs to realize that he's going to have other girlfriends on the side. That's just the male character. That's who they are, and there's nothing she can do about it." And she just has to accept that. Oh, my gosh. That is the message of the male script for masculinity today. And, and Amy, the trouble is that if the, if the church is not offering a positive, healthy view, this is what even young Christian men are reaching out to. Mm-hmm. I have a former graduate student who recently emailed me and said she, she now teaches at high school, high school level. And... um. She said, all my male students are fans of Andrew Tate. Mm. Um, they're even using Andrew Tate quotes in the yearbook. I said, where do you, where do you teach? She said, at a classical Christian school in, in Dallas, by the way. Um, and so I thought, okay, this is, this is what we're up against now. Is I, I think we've seen a bit of a shift. It used to be uh, men, men and boys falling behind, meaning they... They were passive. They were sitting in the mother's basement playing video games. Right. But we're seeing a bit of a shift now to connecting to these online influencers. They're like, get out there. You know, some of their messages are good. Get fit, get strong, eat healthy, you know, get a, get a, get a job. <laughs> but it's in the context mm. of, you know, and, and recover your true manhood. Yeah, who, you know, which is which is this um, sexual predator essentially, mm. and so they they they're getting such a mixed message today. 
Oh my gosh. And you're a hundred percent right. I mean, I, I've taught in Christian co-ops, uh, Christian private school and, and my kids are currently in public school. And that's one thing that, that majority of, of young Christians don't understand is that they, most of them are living a dualistic worldview. You know, they're Christian Sundays and Wednesday nights, but the rest of the week, they are basically living this secular worldview, especially when it comes to relationships and masculinity, because they haven't, they're not aware of the worldviews that are out there. They just see something as being viral. It's popular. This is how I get more followers. And most, I mean, I'm sure, you know, most young people, they want to be influencers. That's their life goal. (laughs) So what do you do? You market yourself to match that, which is already most popular, but then kick it up a notch to make yourself stand out a little bit. But then they don't recognize the worldview that's behind it. And they end up incorporating this secular manifestation of what it is to be a man. And the churches aren't discipling in what true masculinity is and what it's supposed to look like. And I love how you bring out the uh, the, the pre-industrial revolution, because yes, that was one thing, and you've mentioned it in uh, Total Truth as well as Toxic Masculinity. I mean, how the family was meant to function, how they, how they originally functioned, you know, it was the, they were, there was usually a home business. They, they worked together. The skills were passed down um, on the job training from father to son, mother to daughter. Um, I, I was in Europe as well for, for seven years. And yeah, you saw this stewardship, this discipleship, and it was beautiful. But then the home was fractured, father left. And now, you know, especially post uh, uh, second wave feminism, now mother is out of out of the realm. So the children are being brought up mostly within just state run schools and nannies and that sort. Of, so we're seeing this fracturing of the family and it has direct effects on society as a whole. And it's, it's ultimate, it's tragic because again, like you were saying, you know, menhood are man, excuse me, men are vilified through this idea that this brokenness is just inherent to their nature. And if that's the case, there's no escaping that there's no getting better. It's just, oh, men are worthless and ladies, you're better off without them. So it's almost, it's almost a bit twofold to where we not only have to help steward men and what it means to be a man, but we also have to help women from being um, blinded by this false worldview that men are inherently evil and depraved and are just looking to objectify you yeah and well uh, you covered a lot of ground right there so um i wanted to follow up on the fatherhood thing uh, because obviously the uh the long-term solution to better men is better fathers i actually quote there's a psychiatrist who actually says something like that we're not going to have a better class of men until we have a better class of fathers amen bringing up the next generation and so And so that's why it's so um, damaging that we have this negative view of fathers, too, in particular, right? The Homer Simpson uh, pattern or the Bernstein Bears. If if your kids like the Bernstein Bears, Mm -hmm. you know, the father's always the bumbling idiot. Yes. Um, And and that started much earlier than most of us realize. Like most people know that fathers are, you know, mocked and ridiculed in the media, but they don't know why Mm -hmm. when fathers were taken out of the home. Mm -hmm. Almost immediately, people began to feel like, well, they're, they're no longer connected to the family dynamics. Yeah. They, don't, they don't know their kids as well. They don't know what the kids are thinking and feeling. And so already in the 19th century, you see fathers begin to be portrayed as irrelevant, superfluous, mm. and, and incompetent. Yes. And so I do have I do have to put some solutions in the book. And I have a whole chapter on just can we can we flex the workplace even in an industrial age? to allow fathers to have more time with their children. And actually, the pandemic was a game changer. Harvard University did a study. It was so recent, it's not even in the book. But Harvard did a study in which the conclusion was, during the pandemic, 68% of fathers said they got closer to their children, Mm. and they don't want to lose that. Yeah. You know, they prefer to have some kind of hybrid situation, some kind of flexible arrangement, something that will allow them to be with their children more. I thought that was very heartening, Uh, by the way. And it was reported in in the New York Times, which I also thought was heartening (laughs) that they would (laughs) report that, that men want to be with their children more. They want to be more engaged fathers. I I looked at one meta meta survey um, that um, found that 70 percent of men said that they would prefer to flexible hours that allowed them more time with their children, even if it meant a cut in salary. Wow. And a lot of men won't say that Mm. to their boss because they're afraid they'll be, you know, labeled as not committed. But on a, 
on a survey, on an anonymous survey, 70% said they they really want more time with their kids. And I was so shocked because uh, another survey found that men report just as much work-family conflict as women do. We th- tend to think that's a women's issue. Yeah. Men report just as much family conflict, just as much sense of, you know, loss, that they're, they're missing their children's um, milestones, you know, their developmental milestones. They're missing birthdays. They're missing, you know, games, soccer games and so on. And uh, there was um, an article in the Atlantic Monthly not long ago, and it sold more than any other article in that magazine's entire history. And I don't know if you know, but this, uh, this is an old Atlantic started in the 19th century. It's, it's been around a long time. And this article sold the most. And it was a woman who had been in the State Department and um, and was going back to a less stressful job because her children are showing the signs of mother absence. The, the Washington Post put it delicately. Her younger son was toying with juvenile delinquency. Yeah. <laughs> he was causing oh, okay. some trouble. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So she went back to her less demanding job as a professor at Princeton University. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is still prestigious. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, uh, you know, an academic job did allow her more flexible hours. And that, her message was, parents cannot have it all. I'm sorry. You can't. And it was so interesting because that, that took off, like I said. And then Time Magazine followed up with, well, men can't have it all either. Mm -hmm. They feel just as bad that they're missing the milestones with their children. And then MSNBC, I forget, a couple of other news articles came out, all from the men's perspective. Yeah. Saying, don't you think we grieve? Don't you think, you know, we're hurt when our children are missing us, when our children cry because we can't come to the school event or whatever? It's it's anyway. the ma- The main point is, fathers do want more time with their children. By the way, we have to convince the CEOs. So I did do some research, um, and I have these quotes from CEOs in my book as well. For example, um, the one who said, "We were always worried about trying remote work, right? Yeah, because we, you know, people would slough off." And his, direct quote, he says. During the pandemic, that fear was completely exploded. We did not see any discernible drop in productivity. So you can take these quotes to your boss. <laughs> you know, we have to also persuade the corporate world that, that um, as the Atlantic article put it, by the way, she, her conclusion was, if you give parents time to be better parents, they also make better workers. Wow. And oh, and, and I love that so much. And I remember reading a similar article during COVID, um, but it was actually bemoaning the loss of women in the workforce. And they were saying, oh, yeah. well, when COVID happened, women realized that they were burning the candle at both ends and they actually enjoyed being home with their families. And many of them left the workforce to be able to be home with their with their families and raise their children. And they actually bemoaned this as a tragedy. Yeah. But yet, you know, here we're saying, wait a second, no, they're actually reorienting all oh, the family is important. And in the the studies that you mentioned, fathers, they want to be present with their children. And there have been other studies that have found that when it comes to um, like like the articles that juvenile delinquency, delinquency, uh, early drug use, early sexual activities, these all are correlated to a lack of a father's presence, not because he's there. And so, you know, so much of the problems that are going on in society is due to fatherlessness. Oh, absolutely. The numbers are just overwhelming. And you've already mentioned them. Drug and alcohol addiction, dropping out of school, uh, suicide, suicide and mental illness, um, all uh, and crime, crime. Yes. I used to work for Prison Fellowship, uh, which is an international prison ministry. So we knew firsthand uh, kids in behind bars were fatherless kids for the most part. One sociologist puts it this way. Kids, boys raised by traditional fathers do not commit crimes. It is fatherless boys who commit crimes. So the, the tragedy is that today about 40% of American children are growing up apart from their natural father. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they often, they rarely see them, you know, rarely if at all. It is the highest rate of single parenthood in the world. And so I say, I, I suggest this is another thing that the church really should be 
putting a focus on, I would love to see churches do ministries to fatherless boys. Yes. I think that we should make a much bigger deal out of um, a- attending to, you know, having having special ministries, fatherless girls too, but boys feel it worse because generally a girl has the mother in the home still, so she still has a model of what it means to be a woman, but the boy does not have a day in day out model of what it means to me means to be a man, and so there's there's been some research on how parents succeed in passing on their religious convictions to their children. There was a 35-year longitudinal study, a huge mm. study, won all kinds of awards, and they came up with two surprising findings. One is fathers matter more than mothers. Mm. You know, I mean, mothers matter. Mothers have an impact, but statistically, if the father is a Christian, the kids are more likely to follow him yeah. in, into the faith. Uh, but the second thing is the quality of the relationship counts. Mm. If the father is, he can be a moral exemplar, he can be a pillar of the church, he can have perfect theology. Right. But if he's perceived to be cold, distant, and authoritarian, his kids won't follow him. That makes sense. And and there was even a secular um, study that it, w- it was kind of a parallel. They looked, they were looking more narrowly at how do you produce masculine boys? Mm which is part of this debate, right? And what they found is the same thing. They said the, um, the father's own masculinity didn't matter, you know, whether he was more traditionally a macho or not. What mattered was the quality of the relationship. It had to be a warm, close, loving relationship. And then the boy would grow up with a stable, secure sense of masculinity. So it was fascinating that the, you know, the Christian um, study and the secular study found the same thing. But the Christian study also looked at father substitutes mm. and they found that father substitutes can have an enormous impact. And I So we're talking was, like uncles, pastors, mentors, that sort of thing for father substitutes, what you're meaning? And grandparents. <laughs> grandparents. <laughs> grandparents tend to be the most common father wow. substitute. Yeah. Grandparents, uh, coaches, coaches tend to be the next. Okay. Um, but yes, wow. then uncles, teachers, church youth group leaders. I I was um, encouraged to find that they can have quite a big influence. And that means it's something that churches can address. And it means yeah. that it's something you and I, you know, all of us can address. Mm. Because, um, you know, I, I always get asked, but what about the boys who don't have fathers? Yeah. Well, actually, yes, they they do respond well to being loved and nurtured you know, by father substitutes as well. So the the data is clear that 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 it's worth it. Yes. <laughs> it's worth it to reach out to these young fatherless boys. Well, and then affirms that we are designed for community. That is why we are called not to give up uh, worshiping with one another because where mm-hmm. there is a deficiency within the home, oftentimes there is someone being equipped within the church that can pour into that. So that's why we need this this fellowship. And, you know, I just love, I love how you point out how it's, uh, you know, this fatherly relationship conveys spiritual truth. So one thing uh, my pastor, he says is that God will give us physical reminders that point back towards spiritual realities. And if the relationship with child to father to earthly father is, is healthy and rooted, then oftentimes their spiritual relationship also is strengthened and firmly rooted. And so it's just a beautiful how God's design within the physical realm points back toward the spiritual as well. I think that's just fascinating. And, and once again, you know, for the people listening who didn't have good families, you know, who had the, the dysfunctional families and so on, um, I do start the book with a story, with my own story, um, because I did grow up in a severely abusive home. My father was very physically abusive. Um, his favorite was the knuckle fist, you know, the the middle finger extended for a sharper stab of pain because he was punching and kicking. And um, and you can imagine, um, you can imagine as a young adult, I ricocheted off into extreme feminism. Yeah, uh, understandable. I, I read all the feminist books, all the foundational books, and thought they were wonderful. Betty Friedan, Kate Millett, um, Susan Brown Miller. I read them all. I always had some feminist book on my bedside table. Um, and, and then I, I became a Christian and had to sort of rethink this. And so I put my story at the beginning of the book um, in a sense to let people know. That, well, here's how I put it. I've been writing this book my whole life. <laughs> you know, that I didn't come from a warm, secure, happy family. 
mm. know, that this is hard won. Uh, it took me a long time before I could say, even say things like this. I, some, some people ask me, well, what do you think are the differences between men and women then? And so I put this right at the beginning of the book. You may as well get it over with. <laughs> what are the differences? Um, well, clearly, let's start with just the creational givens. Men are bigger, stronger, faster. Because of testosterone, they do tend to be more aggressive and risk-taking. And these are good. You know, this is just how God made men. You know, and I had to practice saying that. I couldn't say yeah. that you know, not that long ago. I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, male characteristics are good. So we have to start with that. These are how God made men, you know, and of course, women, one reason that sometimes people are um, hesitant to, to, to affirm men is because they think that that means that, that we're not affirming women. You know, that we're saying women are weak or whatever. And so we have to also make sure that we're also saying that women's strengths are true strengths. You know, they're different strengths, but they are true strengths that, um, you know, that uh, having babies is their superpower <laughs> and, and that they are equipped with a greater sensitivity and empathy and so on, especially, especially when they actually have children because of the oxytocin and, and, um, which is a bonding hormone. You know, God has equipped uh, women to bond with their babies during those difficult early months, which you are mm. in still. <laughs> <laughs> the sleepless nights, yes. <laughs> the early months where you have to be really motivated because that child needs something 24 hours a day. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yep. But you know what? Here, let me just point this out, though. I, I also was surprised. Scientists have discovered that men have oxytocin, too. Mm when they have a child um the they have it's it's stimulated by a tactile sense so the father has to be actually holding oh cuddling and playing with this mm. with their child for it you know his oxytocin rises and then here was the most recent finding um that an anthropologist discovered that men's oxytocin is actually rising throughout his wife's entire pregnancy oh wow all nine months. Apparently, no one ever thought to test a man's blood, you know, during, during his wife's pregnancy. But when they did, they found that it's going up all through his wife's pregnancy. So God is actually biochemically priming men to be committed and engaged fathers as yeah. well. We we kind of knew that about women, the biochemical side of it, but men have a biochemical boost as well to help them become engaged fathers. That's fascinating. And you know, I've even seen that within my own house, having teen boys, when Maddie arrived, there was a gentleness that all of a sudden, it's this kind of loving fatherliness that was so precious to watch. I mean, they were softer, they were gentle, they were more careful. I mean, not only seeing that come out again in my husband, but to see that being nurtured within my boys too. You know, my husband and I would talk, we're like, this is so sweet and precious to be able to see this gentleness uh, arise in them just mm -hmm. by being within close proximity of a baby. It's just, it is, it's sweet and precious and, I, and God's design's incredible. Okay. So we have covered a lot of really great stuff. We've, we've seen how we got here, um, practical ways that the church can help nurture this through mentoring and equipping with masculinity. And I'm thinking uh, just really quick before we go for the moms of kids and especially teen boys who are caught up with these Instagrammers. I just want to, I want to get caught up really quick. Um, you talk about there's a difference between a real man and a good man. And I think this is an important decision for parents and grandparents and youth workers to be aware of because our kids are being, uh, mm -hmm. the real man is being upheld as this is what a man is supposed to be, but it's the good man. So can you kind of just uh, explain that a little bit for our listeners? Yeah, I love this. It's a study done by a sociologist and he's so well known that he gets invited to speak all around the world. And so he came up with a very clever experiment where he wanted to find out what young men themselves think. And he came up with two questions. First, he asked men, uh, what does it mean if I tell you to be a good man? What is a good man? At a funeral in the eulogy, somebody says he was a good man. What does that mean? And he said all around the world, young men had no trouble answering that question. They would immediately start listing things like duty, integrity, honor, mm. sacrifice, do the yeah. right thing. Look out for the little guy. <laughs> be a protector, be a provider, be responsible. And he'd say, where'd you learn that? And they'd say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. 
um, or we would say they're made in God's image. Mm -hmm. They do, in fact, have this innate universal sense of what wow. it means to be the good man. And then he would ask a follow-up question, though, and he'd say, well, what does it mean if I say to you, man up, be a real man? And the young men themselves would say, no, 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 that's completely different. Wow. That means, you know, be, be tough, never show weakness, win at all costs, suck it up, play through pain. Yeah. Um, Web some dirt on it, move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, be competitive, get rich, mm -hmm. get laid, uh, using their language. Yes. <laughs> um, and so the sociologist, you know, he's not a Christian. He concludes that men are really sort of trapped between these two scripts. On the one, one hand, there is this innate, universal knowledge that men are made in God's image. Uh, Romans 2, right? We all have a conscience. Um, or maybe general revelation. Right? Yeah. Even people without the Bible know that the masculine strength was not given them to get whatever they want, mm. you know, but to care for, to provide for the people that they love. And But they do feel uh, trapped also by cultural messages that say, you know, be tough, get rich, get laid, be, be competitive, and so on, which are more, you know, more toxic traits, the things we now, you know, label toxic. And I thought this was encouraging because what it means is it gives us a much better strategy. Yeah. Most men don't respond well to being called toxic. Mm. You know, nobody would. No shocker, right. <laughs> so is there a way that we can tap into that innate universal knowledge of what it means to be the good man um affirm that encourage that you know um and help them to get in touch with that you know side of themselves that gives us a much more positive way to deal with these issues yeah and one which won't put which doesn't put men off yeah you know which which helps them to see you know w you know as christians we have a different approach we're not well i shouldn't say that. as christians we we sometimes don't have a different approach let me give you the, an anecdote so one of my graduate students um was the head of the women's ministry at a very large baptist church here in houston and she said on mother's day we hand out roses and tell the women they're wonderful yes on, on father's day we scold the men and tell them to do better thank you oh my gosh that used to frustrate me so much i'm like why can't we be building up the guys <sighs> Yeah, so so all the way back to the beginning of the interview, that sociological data showing that Christian men actually do better, they have better marriages, they have happier families. Yes. Bring that into the public, I mean, into the churches first. Mm. Um, it, you know, read my book, look at the sources. Yes. You know, like I said, the academic journals, it's not out there yet. How can we bring that data into the churches? No more scolding, you know, build men up. And and that way, men are hearing a much different message at church. Yeah, uh, I think that's important because if, today, um, you know, I'm on Twitter and I get a lot of red pill type Christian men who feel as though the churches, well, they they've seen that pattern. They say churches, you know, treat women like they're perfect and they're wonderful, and, and uh, it, the problem is always the man. By the way, there's a there's there's a source to that too. <laughs> in the 19th century, uh, was the first time ever in human history that women was set up as morally superior to men. Mm -hmm. It had never been said before. All the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, people thought the insight into right and right and wrong was a rational insight, and they thought men were more rational, and therefore when men were more virtuous. Mm. In fact, the word virtue, the first three letters is the root V I R. It's Latin for man. Oh, fascinating. As in the word virile, right? Yeah. Manly. Yeah. So it was thought that men were more virtuous. And so there was a huge shift in the 19th century. And this is one reason we see this in the churches even today, when men feel like, well, women are treated like they're not sinners. You know, the men are the sinners. They're, they're the vile, evil, corrupt ones. It came out of the 19th century because as the, secular, as the public realm became more secular, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, there evolved these huge, large public institutions like factories and financial institutions and banks and universities and the state. And people began to argue that these large public institutions should operate by scientific principles, by which they mm -hmm. meant value free. Right. You know, don't bring your private values into the public realm, which we still hear today. And since it was men getting that secular education and working in that secular environment, they did, in fact, become secular before women did. Mm. And then if you kick 
values out of the public realm, where are they going to be cultivated mm. in the private realm? Yeah. And who's going to be responsible for cultivating them? You know, women. And so that's how that happened, that women were, in a sense, set up as the moral guardians of society. Yeah. And and in some ways, you know, that we're still fighting that, too. You know, in the dating scene, for example, uh, I was interviewed by a young Christian couple who were just newly married. So I asked them and they said, oh, absolutely. In, in the dating scene, in the Christian world, you know, it's just assumed that men men's lust and sin is just barely being contained under the surface and it's right. up to the woman to keep it in in check it's yeah. up to the woman to always lay down the line oh my goodness and um uh so i think we're still running into that as well you know that w- even in the church today there's somewhat of a double standard of thinking that you know w- women are somehow still morally superior and that men um are just naturally more prone to sin and vice uh, and so we need to stop doing that. <laughs> we need to we need to make the church a place where men feel affirmed mm. and men feel supported. Yes, and that you know, the the Christianity values mm. masculine traits. Yes. Oh, and I love that. And and that's where I, I 100% agree. Not only that that affirmation, that welcoming, but also that that's strategic discipleship on how to lead one's family, how to have this healthy masculinity that needs to be nurtured. Cause so often, like you said, you know, Father's Day, they're chastised and told to do better, but they're not told how. So these yeah. guys are just like, you know, I, I want to fix this. I want to do better, but how do I do that? And the church is just like, well, good luck. And no, that's where we need that, that strategic discipleship, not only just to help nurture men and nurture fathers to take back their family, but to change that next generation. Because we just need to influence that next generation to cause this massive cultural shift. Yeah. And one final thing that I come back to frequently in the book in terms of helping men figure out, you know, what does it mean to be a man? It's the cultural mandate. Um, You know, this is in Genesis. Not all Christians know what the term even means. But theologians talk about um, Genesis where God, God has created the first human couple. And what is the first thing he says to them? He says, why did I create you? You know, what's your purpose? Be fruitful and multiply uh-huh. and subdue the earth. And then the highly streamlined language of Genesis uh-huh. 1, you know, it doesn't just mean have the nuclear family, but, you know, anthropologists tell us all the social institutions grow out of the family. It becomes a clan, a village, a nation, and then specific groups for specific purposes, like you need a state, you need a church, you need a school, you need a marketplace. And so it's much richer. It really means that men are being called to build up the entire society. And then, of course, subdue the earth means harness the natural resources. Yeah. So that starts with agriculture, but also mining, technology, inventing computers, composing music. One of my students said, oh, come on, composing music. I said, well, I play the violin. What's the violin made out of? Wood and the the bow, horsehair. So all the transcendent beauty that we associate with music starts with Mm. harnessing the natural resources of creation. So I think often men feel that Christianity calls them to come to church, sit in a pew and sing and pray. And they don't see that it's much richer than that. And that's why I think the cultural mandate is a way of saying, no, actually, God is calling you to build cultures. That's why it's called the cultural mandate, build cultures, build civilizations, make history. It's a, I, I, and of course it's to men and women, but I think men perhaps need it a little bit more because they, they have such a drive to achieve, to mm. accomplish, to have an impact. And the cultural mandate is what gives them the, you know, the, the guidelines for how to do that. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, Nancy, we, we've had just a wonderful conversation. As we wrap up, do you have any final encouragements for the men in the audience, just in this time and culture, to be bold in the faith? Wow. Well, let me give you one practical thing, which is my, um, my um, publisher just updated my website. So come over, <laughs> come over to nancypiercy.com. And you can leave a, you can also leave a message. You can say hello. You can browse my other books. Um, so that's a, a practical thing. Come on over and find out what else I've written on. I've, I have several books. I come back to the fact that I went through such a feminist phase where I did not value men. And I thought, all, and, 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 and I'd had an abusive father. So it took me a long, hard haul 
to go through the emotional, psychological, and spiritual healing from my father, especially. Um, and I, I do sometimes get people who say, I'm so glad you, I'm glad you put your story in there because there's enough people who come out of dysfunctional, broken and abusive homes. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of Christians don't really adjust that side of things. Um, because we have a bit of a Pollyannish, you know, yeah. just follow God's way and everything will be fine. Right. And because nominal Christian men test out as the most abusive of any group in America, I have actually two chapters on abuse in Christian homes, on uh, domestic violence. I found the best resources I could find. <laughs> and I, I think that if, if you're in a situation where there's any, any form of, of abuse or violence, mm-hmm. I think those last final chapters um, could be extremely helpful. I tried to make it, and I, I got the best secular and Christian resources, yeah. right? Um, and, and made sure that I quoted everyone that I found was that was good, so that people would have a set of resources that they can go to, if you know, if they need more help in establishing a more Christian view, because they have come from a difficult um, and and um, dysfunctional family. I, I think those last two chapters could be helpful for a lot of people. Oh, thank you so much. Well, Mama and Papa Bears, we hope this podcast has been a blessing to you. Uh, Again, check out nancypiercy.com for more information, more resources. Her book is absolutely phenomenal. Highly recommend it. It's available on Amazon. Two days, prime shipping. It can be on your doorstep. Can't recommend it enough. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can head over to mamabearapologetics.com for more podcasts and blogs to help you raise up warriors in the faith. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was great talking with you. And you as well. We'll see you next time, mamas.